Good morning, Bishop Greer, and thank you for allowing me to speak a few words this morning. I'm here for a request. I've directed a film called The General for Jordan about a man of God who gave his life for his country and whose son now, who's 15, is learning how to be a man from the journal that his father left him. Faith-based film, but it's a film not only for believers, more importantly, it's a film for non-believers. So take someone you love, take someone who believes, take someone from your church, but more importantly, take someone who needs to see it. I need you, I want you to be there. We need to show this world where we stand as believers and as Christians. I'm saying thank you in advance for what I absolutely know you're going to do. See you in the movies. Hi, I'm DJ Greer. Welcome to Live Big. Today we are going to dive into the fifth and final installment of the Renewing the Mind series. Let's jump in for the conclusion of this powerful teaching series. Watch this. First Samuel chapter one and verse one, and we're gonna get started. Some say Samuel wrote uh, 1 Samuel. I'm not completely sure who wrote 1 Samuel. But we do know that it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And in verse 1, the Holy Spirit says, Now there was a certain man. Meaning what we're going to study today was not a fairy tale. This was a real man with a real life and real problems. You know, I don't care who you are. Everyone has a chapter or two or three or four or five in their lives. They don't want anyone to read out loud. And we're going to do some reading now about his. A certain man, a Ramatham, Jotham, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, Jerome uh, the son of Elihai, uh, the, the son of Tahu, uh, the son of Zuf, and he was an, an Ephraimite, meaning he lived uh, in the area of the Ephraim tribe. Uh, so we see that he was a man with very, very strong family roots. Matter of fact, First Chronicles chapter 6 adds that he was actually a Levite, meaning he was from, uh, you know, the, the most prominent, the most celebrated religious family in the nation. But I don't care how anointed you are, no family is exempt from pain. And we're going to read a little bit about Elkanah's pain. Verse 2 is the introduction to his problem. And he had two. <laughs> Wives. Somebody asked, did Jesus ever speak against polygamy? Well, I read in the Bible, he said, no man can serve two masters. Okay, the men will chuckle and, uh, okay, all right, all right. But one thing I like about the Bible is it's so honest. It doesn't try to hide the messy facts of its heroes. How many of you know that Noah got drunk? Now, you may not have read it this way, but if you really read it honestly, Abraham had an open marriage. I know, you're like, mm, yeah, read the Bible. <laughs> Moses had a temper, and for that reason, he didn't enter the promised land. And everybody knows about David and Bathsheba. There's only one perfect man, and everyone else needs a savior. So Elkanah had two wives. Now his first wife was, was barren, and her name is Hannah, and we're going to be introduced to her in just, just a moment. And without Social Security like we have today, uh, if you did not have children, there was no one to take care of you in your old age. Also, you didn't have the type of help you needed 
uh, on the farm because typically it was the children that worked uh, on the front farm. And, and if you didn't have children, typically you were in a world of hurt. So he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Panina. Now, every example of polygamy in the Bible uh, is a story of strife and pain. In fact, I have a friend from, from Kenya, uh, and his father had three wives. This was how he grew up. And he told me that sometimes the tension in the camp was, was so thick that when he walked past certain of the wives, the hair on the back of his neck would literally rise up. Now, monogamy in our country used to mean one person for life. But today it only means one person at a time. And it seemed like Elkanah was, was, was in a similar situation. Panina had children. Now, Elkanah chose his second wife very, very, very well because she was literally a baby-making machine. She had at least seven children. Uh, some rabbis said she has many as 11 children. So the fact was, if, if Elkanah just winked at Panina, she got pregnant. This is the way it was happening in that house. But then there's a comma and a clause. But Hannah had no children. Have you ever had people describe you with a but in front of your name? She's pretty, but she's smart, but she's nice, but. So Hannah had a, a lot of things going in her favor, but in this culture and in this time, childbearing was the ultimate achievement of any woman. If you were childless, you were less than. If you were childless, some people would say you were accursed. So Hannah's in this, this marriage and in this relationship carrying some very, very serious emotional baggage. And in verse 3, it says, this man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now, he did this despite the fact the woman he loved could not have children. He did this despite the fact that everything in his life was not perfect. But there was nothing that could keep this man from worshiping God. And we need more men and women like this in the church today. And here's the deal. If you cannot worship because of it, you can worship through it. And sometimes I can't worship because of what's happening in my life, but I can worship God despite it. Do you hear what I'm saying? And this was the type of man that Elkanah was. Also, so on top of all that we just read, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. Now, to most of us, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But the word priests of the Lord there, those, those, those three words are very, very charitable. Because in one translation, the, 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 the way these two chief priests, these, these church leaders were described, they were so immoral, the Bible literally calls them scoundrels. So here we have Elkanah that has a romantic problem. He has family issues. And on top of that, now we see he has church problems. But he still worship. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give 
portions to Penina, his wife, and to all his sons and daughters. The way these sacrifices went, you'd give one portion to God, one portion to the priest, and then your family would share a, a, a portion. And when you ate it, it was, it was much like our Thanksgiving celebration. It was a big deal. The, the whole family would, would get together and it would be a festive time. But how many of us uh, have a relative or two that always show up at Thanksgiving trying to stir stuff up? Okay, you can't say amen maybe because they're in the room, but <laughs> all of us have that. Re- maybe you're that relative, that's why you didn't give me that amen there. But there's always one at the table. So he portions out the meat first to Penina. But in verse 5, but to Hannah, he would give the double portion. So, you know, it's my story. I'm going to tell it the way I want, right? So it was a dark meat family. And Hannah got both legs and a thigh. And Panina and her children, even though they were more, were left with whatever remained. Why did he do this? For he loved Hannah. And Elkanah made sure everybody knew that everybody understood that, that, that the Hannah was his main squeeze. If you, that, that takes you back to the 70s, but that's the way they used to talk. <laughs> For he loved Hannah, although Now, it's really love when you love somebody, although. He loved her despite her butt. See, some of y'all love people because of their butt, but I'm talking about loving people. I'm going to look on this side. Despite her butt. For he loved Hannah, although the Lord closed her womb. Now, I'm not going to claim to understand it all, but according to Scripture, God somehow had something to do with her infertility here. Sometimes there's a purpose in your pain. Sometimes there's a purpose in your pain. This side of the room. Sometimes there's a higher purpose to your pain. But if God could close a womb, he could open a womb. And her rival, when two women love the same man, you know you got yourself a problem. Love is great, but love also has a dark side. And some things are just not meant to be shared. And her rival also provoked her severely. Meaning, if you were at that Thanksgiving meal and looks could kill, Hannah would have choked on that turkey leg and cranberry sauce. There was such steam and heat coming out of Panina's eyes when she looked at or even thought about Hannah. And she provoked her, not, you know, not not, not just a little bit, severely. I mean, this this was extreme to make her what miserable. So so again, what would happen is is Hannah would get her two legs and and everything, but immediately uh, Panina would pull out her her iPhone and start swapping, uh, or pull up baby pictures and start swapping, you know, on the phone, talking about, you know, Elkina, don't don't the babies look like you? And and, and remember that time, you know, and and remember, you know, when all that that, 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 that's going on, and, and she reminds everyone who can make babies and those who could not. So at the meal, she'd roll her eyes at Hannah. 
she'd make jokes about Hannah. Worst of all, she would sleep with Hannah's husband. I want you to understand the pain in the room. Hurt people hurt people. And there's a lot of anguish going on. So Panina tries to get a rise constantly out of Hannah. And some say Hannah was a little more, bit more delicate and a little bit more dainty than Panina. Meaning if Vaseline was ever put on their face and cornrows got in the hair, <laughs> Hannah didn't have a chance. Panina knew it and provoked her severely to make her miserable all because, and the only reason they were in this situation, the only reason he took this next wife was because Hannah couldn't have a baby or the Lord closed the womb. But here I want you to see something, and this is why I love the scripture. Like I said, it's not trying to be cute. It's not trying to be, probably it's not trying to make it look like everything was, 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 was perfect. It's just a real book that talks about real life and shows us how to handle real things. What we see here is having a double portion in one area of your life doesn't always make up for the deficit in other areas of your life. Both women were in a bad situation, but it really wasn't fair to take it out on little Hannah. So it was year after year after year after year. The same celebration, the same mocking, the same jokes, the same tension, the same strife, the same problem. When she went to the house of the Lord. Now, if, if, if man wrote this book, he'd be like, well, if you go to church, everything's going to be okay. It, it would have left that part out. But what you see is even though she went to the house of the Lord, not only every now and then, but regularly, as often as it was required, she still had problems. So it was year by year when she went to the house of the Lord that she still dealt with this bully. And she provoked her. Therefore, Hannah began to weep, and she did not eat. Finally, Hannah got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we've been talking about renewing the mind. And I want to tell you, some things will not change in your life until you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. But then her, her husband, Elkanah, tries to console her, try, tries to comfort her. He's a, he's, he's a good husband. He loves her. And he said, Hannah, why do you weep? He was paying attention to her emotional state. He's looking in her eyes and saw her pain. Why are you, are, are you crying? Why do you not eat? And, and why is your heart so grieved? And then he says, am I not better than ten sons? Sometimes men just don't understand everything. Sometimes we're not so, so bright. But Hannah, the Bible said, she arose. But this time, Hannah got up with a look on her face. And oh, it was about to happen. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating. They're making fun of her, the butter jokes, talk about what she can't do, baby pictures came out, all the rest. They finished eating and drinking. This is all happening in church, by the way. I mean, you think that everything's supposed to, I've been in church for a long time. 
All this happened with people that were worshiping God. So don't be surprised. If even though you worship every now and then, you face some problems. So Hannah rose after she had finished eating and drinking. And what I find in life is until the, the pain of staying the same surpasses the pain or the risk of change, nothing happens. But when you finally realize, if I stay this way, it's going to be worth You're hungry, but there's a lion outside your tent, and you got to get some food. If you get hungry enough, you will face that lion. Sometimes the reason we don't change is because we're not hungry enough yet. We're not sick and tired enough yet. And you keep putting up with it, that's why you stuck with it. Pay attention to what I'm trying to say to you this morning. So she rises up. But like I said earlier, until you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, nothing's going to change. Rosa Parks just was going home a little bit tired one day, too tired to stand, and it spawned the civil rights movement. Mike Tyson got tired of being bullied in Brooklyn, and it caused him to become the heavyweight champion of the world. George Washington got tired of the king, so he became the first president of the United States. What's it going to take for you to get sick and tired of being sick and tired of situations that go on year after year after year after year, though you go to church, though you have prayed, though you have, when are you going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired? Now, Eli, he's the good priest, the priest was seated, sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. So he's doing his job, watching the people, kind of like a lifeguard at a pool, you know, paying attention, making sure everyone's doing right. Then he spots this lady. The Bible says, and she, or Hannah, was in bitterness of soul. See, we medicate our pain, so we never get to this place. Or we go on a shopping spree to, to try to cover the pain. Or we call up a girlfriend just as busted and broke up as we are, so, so we could, you know, feel a little bit of sympathy and, and feel like we're not the only ones and, and, and all the rest. So, so often we don't get to the place that Hannah got, but she refused to medicate it. She, she, she refused to, to watch, you know, 17 hours on Netflix. She, 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 she refused to do what everybody else or most others would do in her situation. She was brave enough to feel her pain. Jesus on the cross, they offered him some myrrh to deaden and dull what he was going through. He said, no, I'm going to feel what I need to feel so I can get through this thing on the other side. And he didn't need a crutch. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Nothing wrong with a little bit of television, not, nothing wrong with, with, with some friends, but there are moments. There are miles in this life. You got to walk it alone. And there's pain you got to feel. Pay attention to what I'm saying. I wish I could say this differently. I wish I could tell you, give your life to Jesus, you'll never ever have a problem again. 
But that's just not in the Bible. Paul was beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, betrayed, hated, talked about, rejected. But at midnight, Paul and Silas worshiped. There is pain in this life. And Hannah was in bitterness of soul. But like I said, instead of putting on the Vaseline, instead of cornrow in her hair, she prayed to the Lord. It's okay to get upset at times. The Bible says, in your anger, sin not. It doesn't say anger is necessarily sin. My Bible said Jesus flipped over some tables. My Bible says that Jesus at times, uh, uh, the Bible said he groaned in the, in the spirit, but that's polite. He actually got angry. The problem's not getting angry. In fact, if you don't get angry, you're probably out of touch. Anger is it's kind of a secondary emotion. And a lot like pain. Pain lets you know something's wrong. I mean, without pain, we would harm ourselves, hurt ourselves. I wouldn't know I broke a bone, and I, I, I'd probably keep playing football and, and end up not being able to walk again. Pain is letting us know, hey, something needs attention. And anger can often be a very, very similar thing. It's an indication Something has gone awry. Something is out of order. But she was in bitterness of soul. She was hurting. She, 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 she was in anguish, real pain. In fact, in our brains, the same place physical pain registers is the same area of our brain that, that emotional pain registers. So when Jesus was on that cross, it wasn't just the physical pain. It was the rejection. It was the humiliation, the embarrassment that he took for each of us. So she, she's in bitterness, but in that bitterness, she took it to the Lord. Not her girlfriend, not legal marijuana, She took it. I said it to y'all in, the, in that. The. She took it to the Lord. And she wept in anguish. It was raw. It was real. This was a wet face, quivering lip, snotty nose, guts on the table type prayer. I'm talking about a Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart type of prayer. I'm not talking about that prayer you pray thinking about what you're going to cook for what you're going to have for dinner when it's over. I'm not talking about that type of prayer where you're like, I can't wait till this is over, but I just got to kind of do my religious duty. I'm talking about uh, when you seek me, you will find me. When you seek me with your whole heart, kind of prayer. So then Hannah, see, the difference between Panina and Hannah was one prayed, the other didn't. One would take matters in her own hand and provoke and, and frustrate and make fun of. But Hannah was of a different mind. She had a renewed mind. Then Hannah made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, Lord of a multitude, armies, this is a barren woman. You need to pray to God. Who, you got, the, the, if you got sickness in your body, you need to know him as a healer. Pay attention to what I'm saying. 
If you're dealing with depression, you need to know him as your joy. If you're dealing with confusion, you need to know him as your peace. So she's dealing with barrenness, but she worships a God of a multiplicity, a God of a multitude, a God that produced all that is, the one that made the ocean stream, that made the jungle full of all the lions, tigers, the bears, and you know, you hear what I'm saying? So, so she had a revelation who her God was, pay attention. And if you don't have a revelation of who your God is, you won't turn to him in that area of your, in, in, of your life. And she made a vow, said, oh, Lord of hosts, oh, God, and you, you're the one that created all those, 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 those billions of insects. I mean, there's stuff crawling and creeping that I can't even wrap my head around. You, you are a God of plenty. You're the one that holds, owns a cattle on a thousand hills. All the creatures of the earth are yours. He said, oh, Lord of hosts, if you will look. On my affliction. She didn't call it something it was. Oh, God, I'm okay. I'm okay. No, she wasn't okay. Of your maidservant, and watch this, and remember me. Am I the only one that's ever felt forgotten? And not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant, she's specific about what she wants, a male child. Then I will give him to the Lord. So she's sincere. She's specific. And now she gets sacrificial. The reason I read the Bible is not just because I'm trying to be a good Christian boy. It's because God doesn't change. And when I need, read these narratives, I'm like, well, if God did that for her, if God did that for him, he's the same God. If I would just do what they did, believe what they do, I can get the same results. But the difference between Hannah and many of our prayers, I'm not talking about you, it's the person next to you, always the person next to you, always, okay? was she prayed sincerely, specifically, but lastly, sacrificially. She made a heart commitment to give something back to the Lord. A lot of us want stuff from God. Give me God, give me God, give me God, give me God. But let there be a Sunday when I preach on talking about giving something back to God. Everybody gets stiff. Everybody gets all tight. It's your neighbor. It's your neighbor. It's not you. It's your neighbor. <laughs> Hannah was willing to give it back. I don't want God to ever give me anything I can't give back to him. If I can't give it back to him, I'm not ready for it. It will become an idol in my life. It will become chief in my life. And it happened as she continued. And this teaches a lot about prayer. Sometimes prayer takes a little bit more than, than just two seconds. She continued. She prayed through her pain. She prayed while she was in pain. She continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her, her mouth. Now, verse 13 goes into some description here. Now Hannah was speaking in her heart. No, you didn't hear me. Sometimes words come out my mouth, but it's not really heart yet. I have discussions with the Lord much of the day, but it's not always a heart to heart. You may tack on on Jesus' name at the end of your prayer, but is it really from the heart? Hannah. 
spoke in her heart. And Jeremiah promises us, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Hannah spoke in her heart and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Everyone's not always going to understand. Everyone's not always going to get it or get you. But Hannah wasn't praying for other people to say amen. She was praying for the audience of one. And in him, the Bible says, is the amen. You hear what I'm saying? And so be it. So Eli said to her, he's a good priest, but he didn't get it. And every, even good people aren't always going to get it. This is why sometimes we need to pray by ourselves. Because people don't know the whole story. They won't get everything we're saying. That's why Jesus got up early and he go up by himself to pray. Because nobody would often get it. 14. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your, 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 your wine away from you. So her, her husband couldn't help her. Her rival provoked her. Now her, her pastor misunderstands her. But God promised, <laughs> if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. I just, I want to just pause here for just a second. Hannah didn't kirk out on Eli because she didn't get it. I'm going to skip it, but the next couple verses, she answers for herself. Respectfully, patiently, but firmly. And we got to learn to answer for ourselves, not get so quickly offended because everybody doesn't get us. Verse 17. We're, we're almost there. We're, we're going to end at 20. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace. And the God of Israel, the God of many, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, grant your petition which you have asked of him. Eli was a spiritually sensitive man. He had some bad boys, and they were all messed up, and we, we, we talked about those two scoundrels already. And just because you're a good parent don't mean your children are going to do everything right. How many of y'all know Adam wasn't born in a bad neighborhood? Adam had the best spiritual father possible, but he still. So if Adam in the perfect environment, perfect man, no curse, no nothing, if that man can sin, I don't care how perfect you try to create the, the environment, parents, sometimes kids are going to do stuff, all right? Just like you did stuff, okay? Okay, I feel like I, I think I can go back to the text. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace, the God of Israel grants your petition, which you, you asked of, of him. So, so Eli knew that God heard her, her prayer. I, I, I don't know that God or a prayer has one, just one, just one key. It's more like a combination lock that, 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 that we work until it clicks. I can't explain it. But I, I, I have an issue. I bring it to the Lord. I'm upset. I'm bothered. And, and you know, I, I'm being frank with God and having a, a hot conversation, honest, open, and transparent. I'm, I'm really pouring it out before the Lord. And, and, and five minutes, ten minutes, and I'm still having the same conversation, feeling the same way. But, but amazing. I don't know. You know, sometimes it happens in ten minutes, sometimes in a couple days. But then there's a click. Well, I know that I know. God heard and something has been unlocked. But that doesn't always happen in the first 30 seconds. It doesn't always even happen in the first 24 hours. But prayer is like that common. You remember in the lockers, those of you, yeah, I mean, now I think it's all uh, um, digital. But back in the day, you, you, you turn that thing and then you hear that. 
And prayer is just like that. You pray until you hear the click. Watch what happens. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate. She was crying just a second ago, just a second ago. I mean, snot running out, lips quivering, and just hold it and just... Everything about her changes because she got that click in her spirit. Here is my big question to you today, particularly the religious folk in the room. Do you pray just so you could say you prayed? Or do you pray until you hear the click? Do you pray until that shift happens? I'm, I don't know if I can say what I'm saying as much as I want to impart to you what I'm saying. Stop being so religious. Pray in your long and lengthy, accurate prayers. It's not until my prayer time gets messy that I know I'm being honest. Pay attention to what I'm saying. And I'm not praying just so I can say I prayed. I'm too busy for that. I'm praying until on the inside. I know I've heard an amen and so be it, till on the inside I hear a click. And it's amazing, I could have the problems of this world on my shoulders. And all of a sudden, just a moment in prayer. And the sun rises and everything is, and people are like, what happened to him? God. God. 19, we're almost there. Then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Watch what worship can do. Watch it. And returned and came to the house at, at Ramah. Now Hannah came, came back into the house. She'd just been crying. But she's probably put all makeup on and all the rest. And she's coming to the house singing, All of me loves all of you. Something about all them curves and edges. All them perfect imperfections. So, so, so Hannah comes in the house, snapping a finger and a little sly smile on her face. Like I said, it's my story. I tell her how I want. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. And the Lord remembered her. Now, this is anthropomorphic language. I mean, just like the Bible says, arise, O God. Is God ever not risen? It's like the Bible says, you know, God's arm's not too short to save. Does the Father really have an arm? I don't know. He's a spirit. It's anthropomorphic language kind of breaking it down in a way that we understand. Elka knew his wife and the Lord what remembered, not that he forgot, but because of what just happened, God was about to take action. Why? Because Hannah was like, God, if you're going to forget anybody, you're not going to forget me. And sometimes you got to go to God in prayer. You may not have healed everybody. Everybody may not get it, but a thousand may fall at my left hand, 10,000 at my right, but it shall not come near me. God, I'm going to get that which you promised me, me and my house. You know, it's going to go a certain way. Oh, God, you got to get that attitude in prayer. So it came to pass in the process of time, verse 20, and we're wrapping up that Hannah conceived and bore a son. And here's my, my, my big point. I've been making it all morning long. Hannah did not receive this child because she was a good Jewish girl. 
She didn't receive this child because she was a good church girl. She got what she wanted because she finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And she brought her burdens to the Lord. Now, I want to say something to you. Three quarters of prayer is the right attitude. You think if I get the words right, he ought to hear. But the right attitude is about three quarters of prayer. And what I hope you have heard from me throughout this series is attitude. And if you get the right attitude, an attitude of faith, an attitude of boldness, an attitude of humility, an attitude of trust, an attitude of, Lord, I can't, but you can. When you get the right attitude, it's amazing how things begin to change. Thanks for tuning in. I hope that you enjoyed today's teaching. Remember, if you haven't already seen parts one, two, three, and four of this series, I recommend that you take a moment to watch each of them and really get strong in God. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a book that changed my perspective on faith. And when God stops, my favorite story was about Zacchaeus and how he didn't allow obstacles in his life to hinder his pursuit of Jesus. In the end, his actions led to a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jesus and a changed spirit. If you want to learn more about what it takes to get God to stop and address your particular need, be sure to get your copy today. My announcer is coming with more information. Question, how do you get God to stop for you and give special attention to your situation? What does it take to stand out in the crowd and get God-sized results? Find the answers to these questions and more in Derek Greer's latest book, When God Stops. This one-of-a-kind book highlights eight hidden figures from the Bible who show us how to dream, think, and live the type of life that God not only notices, but one that He rewards. Not only that, but in this book, Derek Greer shares his personal journey like he never has before. Hear his testimony and go beyond what you see to get the real story behind Derek Greer's most life-changing moments with God. So jumpstart your faith today. Learn how to get God's special attention and see God-sized results in your life. Go to WhenGodStops.com today. That's WhenGodStops.com to find out more. Until next time, I invite you to subscribe to the Derek Rear Ministries YouTube channel to access my dad's latest teachings, revisit your favorite broadcast, watch ministry minutes, and share your favorite teachings with your friends, family, and loved ones. While you are there, be sure to hit the notification bell so you know when new content has been uploaded. Best of all, subscribing to the Derek Rear Ministries YouTube channel is free. More information is coming soon, and until next time, live big. Connect with Derek Greer Ministries on social media to access Bishop Greer's latest teachings and content. Follow on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, be sure to subscribe to Bishop Greer's YouTube channel at Dr. Derek Greer VA and get the latest episodes, ministry minutes, noonday teachings, and more. While you're there, be sure to hit that notification bell to find out when Bishop Greer's latest power-packed videos are uploaded. So subscribe and get ready to propel your spiritual life forward in 2021 and beyond. Check out the Derek Grimm Ministries YouTube channel. Revisit your favorite moments from the Live Big broadcast and watch popular teachings. Get in the now hot takes and dive into Bishop Greer's Ministry Minute and bite-sized noonday teachings that can only be found online. Get all of this and more at home or while on the go. So, subscribe to the Derek Greer Ministries YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to get fresh content from Derek Greer that will help you grow stronger, lift bigger, and get closer to God. Derek Greer Ministries is certified by the ECFA. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time on Live Big with Derek Greer.